Today is November 19th, 2020, and my guest is author and broadcaster Michael Blastland. He is the author of The Hidden Half, The Unseen Factors That Influence Everything. Michael, welcome to Econ Talk. Thank you. What's The Hidden Half? What do you mean by that in your title? One of the great human endeavors is finding all those regularities that govern the way that people behave, the way that systems work, the way that one thing causes another. I mean, that's what we spend most of our time doing. It's a great part of our human instinct to look for the way that one thing leads to another. You know, even the even the way my brakes work on my bicycle, you know, uh, I, uh, I'm pretty sure they're going to stop it. And I know that because they usually do. There's some kind of regularity there. And uh, also because I can look at that mechanism and I can say, well, it looks like the kind of thing from previous experience that ought to slow my bike down. So, you know, we're, we're observing patterns all over the place. We're observing, you know, if you have certain experience in youth, does it make you more likely to be a criminal? Uh, if we put up the minimum wage, does it cause unemployment? You know, this is, this, is, this is what we do as intelligent human beings. We look for patterns and regularities. The hidden half is where those break down. And my contention is that actually there's a lot more breakdown than we would wish for uh, in some ways of looking at the problem. And there's uh, a lot more breakdown than is admitted. In other words, there is a huge reservoir of sources of discontinuity, irregularity, chance, lux, stochasticity, whatever you want to call it, which disrupts our ability to know things. There's a simple way, in fact, of thinking about knowledge, which is that it is a kind of regularity. You know, I know something from this experience of it, and therefore I predict that it will work again tomorrow. My alarm clock will go off tomorrow because it went off yesterday. You know, this, this, this is very kind of simple things. I'll go home and I find my bedroom and my bed and I'll be able to sleep, you know, and with luck. Uh, the, the kind of normal everyday regularities. That's what knowledge is. It's the, the way that information about something travels to the next instance. And as I say, my contention is that it doesn't travel as well as we hope it will because of what I call this hidden half of countervailing factors, enormous number of detailed countervailing factors which disrupt it. I think it was Alfred North Whitehead who said, uh, actually, knowledge and, and effectiveness advances when we don't think about things. And a bunch of things that we've figured out, like my alarm clock will probably reliably go off tomorrow. Once I set that little green light on my iPhone, I stop thinking about it because I've seen it work pretty, reli not pretty reliably. It always works unless I have the volume off and then I messed up. So it's actually, it's, it's a good example of how it's, it's a little more, that's the hidden app. Um, but, but that's a feature, not a bug most of the time that we don't think about the things we think are true. But of course, the bug part is that sometimes they're not true. <laughs> I, no, I, I think that's exactly right. It, it kind of, it's very easy for these things to go under the radar. Um, you know, because we, we settle into habitual patterns of behavior, which very much rely, they depend on these tacit pieces of regularity that we've grown used to, that we've come to assume. And, um, you know, there's a great, there's a great quote of uh, Daniel Kahneman's you'll be familiar with, probably maybe you'll know Danny, um, who says that it's a, it's a fault of the uh, academic mind, actually, that once you've applied some kind of model, some kind of theory, some kind of framework to the way that you think things work, a very often academic one, it's pretty hard not to do it in future. Yeah. It's pretty hard just to sort of clear out the mental furniture. Once it's in there, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a tough job to remove it again. We have these settled presumptions about how things are, and, and we need to. To some extent, you couldn't you couldn't kind of revisit the whole caboodle every day Correct. you got up in the morning. We, we we just have to do it that way. Yeah, I, I think of myself as as kind of a specialist in confirmation bias, and I think about it a lot. And uh, I'm quite aware that despite that focus, I still suffer from it. I I see myself making leaps of presumption about the quality of this study or that study based on the worldview framework perspective I bring to it. And I think it's very important. Now, your book starts with a rather startling um, beginning. And uh, let's talk about crayfish. Um, you wouldn't think that crayfish would be very interesting, and you wouldn't think they'd have much to do with what we're talking about. But it turns out they're a spectacularly thought-provoking uh, example of, of the phenomenon you're, you're mentioning. So 
Talk about crayfish. Crayfish are just they're just a wonderful story. I mean, it starts in an aquarium in Germany. So you can tell this is going to be weird. Um, <laughs> these enthusiasts for aquaria in uh, in Germany and amongst their collections, you know, some of them have a crayfish. And um, this is a recognized crayfish. You know, it's been imported actually from the United States, from Miami, I think, that kind of area. And um, they pop it in their aquarium. And, you know, it's just one crayfish. And it has offspring. And this happens in a few places. And people say, well, that's, that's weird because there's no male. Okay, well, maybe, maybe it, you know, maybe it got pregnant or whatever crayfish do, the equivalent term, um, uh, in transit or in its, in its place of origin or at the shop where I bought it from or something like this. But, you know, um, anyway, they, 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 they observe this and they're a bit puzzled by this. And, but gradually they begin to realize that all the crayfish, even the offspring, are also female. And they're still having offspring. And they're saying to themselves, where are the males? You know, they're, they're all females. There are no males here. Uh, you know, some people's dream world, by the way. You know, you can yeah. have an ocean without, without males involved. Anyway, they, um, they gradually begin to suspect that these creatures somehow spontaneously have become part of genetic. So they're, they're reproducing asexually without any sexual contact. They've basically become, they've acquired the ability to clone themselves. Now, nobody quite knows how they've, done this you know it seems to have been one spontaneous genetic mutation in just one crayfish somewhere along the line and then of course once one can do it all its offspring have the same genetic capability so they can do it too uh, i mean this is this is um the consequences for this are fantastic because you only need to release one of these things in the wild and suddenly you know you've got a whole population and actually that's happened there are areas of the world malaysia i think where these things have got out into the wild and they've just only overrun the place they're, they're highly fecund. They, they breed like crazy. Um, you know, they're robust creatures. They're, they're not fragile. Easy. You can put them on a barbecue, by the way. If you like a barbecued crayfish, you know, maybe <laughs> you should think about this variety. Um, eventually, they were called marmacrebs. You know, they were given this name marmacrebs because the scientists got to hear about these things, you know, and their eyes lit up. You can imagine, hey, we have a new species, an entirely new species doesn't exist in the wild. It's popped up spontaneously in Aquaria in Germany. And we can use this because it suggested to them that here was a way of understanding that old thorny question about the balance of forces between nature and nurture. You know, because we've, we've got half the problem contained. It's absolutely nailed down. They are genetically identical. So if we see differences in these creatures, well, it's got to be the other one, hasn't it? It's got to be the environmental cause in that case. So they got a few hold of these, these few of these things, and they started putting them into into tanks in the lab. Uh, but they also went a step further, and this is where it gets really interesting, because they also standardised their environments. So they made sure that the water every single creature was in was the same. They made sure that all their food was the same. They made sure that every single creature had more than enough to eat, so there needn't be any competition for food. They put quite a lot of them on their own, so there wasn't even any interaction. They had the same person examine them on every occasion using the same variety of rubber gloves. You know, they, they tried basically to standardize everything they could think of and make their environments as boringly uniform as, as imaginable. And this is Germany. They, you know, <laughs> they're good at that. Um, so um, what did they look like, these creatures, as they developed? Because now we have perfectly consistent genetics. They checked that. They didn't just assume it. We have, as far as humanly possible, a consistent environment. These are the big two causes, as far as we know, of everything. So OK. Marmor crepes, you know where this is going. They're fantastically varied. There's a you can take marmor crepes from the same batch of eggs, and one of them turns out 20 times the weight of another. The physical variety is just astonishing. They're genetically identical, their environmental environments are identical. They're all fed to excess, no competition for food. One is 20 times the weight of another. The carapace on every single one of them, this, this shell, is, is, um, has a different pattern of markings. They have these little feeding parks around the front of the mouth, 
they have different numbers, different physical numbers. It's like having different numbers of teeth. You know, um, they, they're, so they're physically different. They're also behaviorally different. Some of them like a crowd, some of them are loners. You know, some of them are really gregarious. Um, some of them are dominant. When you bring them together, some of them turn out to be dominant, and some of them are, are, are kind of subservient. Some of them feed when they're laying, some of them don't. Uh, the, t the point in life when they start laying eggs is quite radically different. Their lifespans vary by a factor of three. You know, imagine that in human terms, you know, I mean, uh, where, it, where you're, you know, take triplets, genetically identical, uh, standardized environments, and imagine their lifespans varying by a factor of three as a norm. You know, I mean, th it, just the variety in these creatures was absolutely dumbfounding. And you say, okay, uh, once you've got over the shock, um, why? How, uh, what, what's going on? in order to produce this kind of variety when everything we know is the same. You know, we've got, you've got something the same clearly isn't in some way the same, but what is it that's different? And this is, this is where we come back to the original definition of the hidden half. You know, that all the time we're looking for the big regularities. And here are two of the most Herculean regularities we've ever come across, genetics and environment. And it's neither. <laughs> you know, so now, now, how how powerful is this effect? Well, some of the descriptions of the variations you can tell. You know, it's it's a pretty strong effect. This this whatever it is, this third cause, this this hidden half, this something. Um, uh, if we get around to talking about people, uh, you know, there are in some ways you can argue that it really is about a half of the way that things turn out is accounted for by factors which we simply can't define in normal terms. So. If it's a half, that's the equal of the other two put together, which is one way of thinking about it. You know, you I, think you think of about the human history of argument over genetics versus environment, and you know, and the way we've slaughtered each other about that, uh, and the way that it's still such a bloody argument. You know, in I mean, I don't mean that just metaphorically, and you say there's something else, which is the equal of them both. Where's the conversation about that? Where's the argument there? You know, where's the scientific recognition of this vast range of uncertainty? Because it's thoroughly unpredictable. We can talk in a minute about some of the potential causes. But for me, it's, it just opens up a kind of range of possibilities about the determinants of life, the causal factors that we began talking about, that um, it's just irresistible. You, you can't hear that story and start, you know, getting curious about the way the real influences on the way the world works. Well, I thought of it as the dark matter of causation. It's the things that we can't, the hidden half is the dark matter. It's, we know it's there because it has to be. What is it? Well, it's the dark matter. It's the hidden, yeah, it's, we have a word for it actually. We call it often randomness, yeah. but that's just a way to describe the fact. It sounds kind of scientific actually. You could even put a Greek letter on it, but like, uh, you know, an eta. But in, in fact, it's, um, and we sometimes call it noise, which sounds a little yeah. less scientific, but it's um, it really raises some very deep philosophical questions. And it reminds me of my favorite, one of my probably five favorite jokes, which I heard from Joseph Telushkin. Uh, it's about the, I think I've told it once before on the program. It's about the 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 kid. He's uh, you know the seventh grader. He's looking at his report card as his father looks over his shoulder at it, and it's all D's and F's. It's it's a horror show. And the father's getting more and more upset, and the kid turns over back to look at his dad and says, "What do you think, Dad? Nature or nurture?" <laughs> so, <laughs> and what you're suggesting, of course, is what actually that joke's quite appropriate because the dad's reaction is, "No, it's neither. It's you. <laughs> it's something distinctive that you've messed up." Uh, and it does raise a question of, of of free will, right? Because I think. Most of us believe that, as you say, nature and nurture describe everything. That's it. We're all the victims or the uh, – we're given these gifts or punished by our genetics and, and the way we were raised and the th expo things we're exposed to. And this suggests there's something else. Um, talk about Mike Tyson and his brother. Okay, I mean, I think you're right. By the way, there are there are big questions raised there by uh, about genetics and uh, 
nurture and um, this very peculiar appetite I think some people have for reducing ourselves to machines. Yeah. Who are, you know, and, 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 you know, we have these two arguments, but they're both deterministic. Yeah. That's what's why, why do you want either of them, actually? Why, why, you know, why would you wish for either of them to be true? Well, if you're a researcher, you might. Hey, uh, no, <laughs> that's, I think that's the thing. And, and, you know, there are researchers who talk about this, uh, this element as you, you said dark matter. I call it the hidden half. There's, there's one who talks about the gloomy prospect. So the gloomy prospect is that in research terms, we'll never be able to nail some of this stuff down. And this is <laughs> horrifying to them. Um, okay, so um, so Mike Tyson, well, you know, you start to say about the Marma Krebs, okay, um, these are weird animals. We can't really interrogate their lives too carefully. They can't tell us what's going on. So maybe there are micro environmental influences or something which we're just not gonna get out. People, on the other hand, are much more accessible. We should be able to, we can go in there with the surveys and the questionnaires and the life studies and all the rest of it. And we can get much more information about them and possibly pick out some of the causal influences. Now, the curious thing about Mike Tyson is that he's he's spoken of and speaks of himself, actually, as someone who is very much the product of his upbringing. He grew up in a, a world where violence was common, crime was the norm. I think he'd been... <laughs> arrested something like 38 times by the time he was 13, 14. Um, he was in one of the most uh, notorious juvenile prisons, I think it's been referred to. Uh, he grew up in a home where his um, father wasn't really his father and soon fled the coop anyway. Uh, his mother, he says, was violent towards him. I mean, and the stories are the stories are horrifying. If you read his autobiography, I think he says at one point, I, you know, I did a lot of bad bad stuff in so many words. Um, so you say, okay, Mike Tyson, he went on, uh, the rap sheet just keeps on growing. And is it any surprise? You know, having grown up in a culture of violence, uh, he, you know, he was subsequently, he bit off another boxer's ear. Uh, he was in prison for rape. And you kind of think, oh, yeah, that's about what you'd expect in a way. Uh, not a very um, sympathetic view in some ways. In others, you kind of feels as if you might be making allowances for him. I don't want to get into that, really, just to observe the fact that many people say this is kind of history is destiny. Mike Tyson has a brother. His brother is a uh, uh, specialist trauma assistant in a hospital in Los Angeles where he patches up the victims of violence. He had that same upbringing. So now you say, okay, well, which is the causal influence now? And, and, you know, pretty soon you start making excuses. You try and find reasons why it could affect one person that they're different to the other. And you say, well, Mike reacted one way. Um, his brother reacted the other way, you know, and, um, it, but they were all reacting to violence in one form or another. The problem is, once you've said that, how do you know which way this most extreme of causal influences is going to pan out because we've now accepted that it can take you in two diametrically opposed uh, directions. So our predictive ability, you know, you suddenly begin to realize, well, which is it going to be? And that kind of, at the individual level, destroys quite a lot of our ability to define causal pathways. As it turns out, um, uh, you know, you... Um, you can narrow it because some people will be saying, you know, okay, they're brothers, but maybe they just differ genetically. And that explains why one went one way and the other. But you can then do the same, similar sorts of things with genetically identical twins. So you say, okay, like the Marma Krebs now, we're getting there. We've got identical uh, genetics and we've got a very, very similar upbringing because, you know, they're in the same household, same parents, same school, uh, you know, same TV, uh, pretty much same diet. Um, and you can say things like, okay, if one of these twins has schizophrenia, what's the likelihood the other one will? Well, it's not 100%. It's about 50%. Now, that's quite a lot of regularity. It's a lot more than you'd find in, uh, amongst two strangers, but there's still a half of it that's missing. You can go even further. You can take conjoined twins, and you can find examples where actually there are still astonishing differences between them. There were two, two conjo there was conjoined twins in, um, in, uh, in the Far East who actually 
undertook the most dangerous operation in order to be separated because they felt they were so distinctive as individuals that they could not lead a life together. They had different interests. They, um, one of them wanted to live at home. The other one wanted to go to the big city. One wanted to be a lawyer. The other one wanted to be a writer. Um, you know, they, they had different hobbies. Um, they, were, they were extraordinarily different. Now, that you, we're get, so we're getting closer and closer to the point where we're saying, like the Marmacrebs, everything is the same. I, I'll take you even one step further. Um, you know, if you're still not satisfied that there could be room for causes in the normal sense, you know, that we can understand and define, I'll take you down to one person. Even in one of us, even in me or you, Russ, just draw a line down the middle of our face, and there are differences side to side. Now, that's nature trying to apply the genetic program identically to make a, a carbon copy, as we call them, you know, carbon copies. Are Symmetric. <laughs> yeah, symmetrical. And it can't do it. I think some people would say, okay, only in a trivial way. The differences are never that big. You can still see that it's the same person. Um, so let's take a more serious example. Let's take a case of breast cancer in one breast. We're going to put aside some of the big genetic causes of that for a moment, the BRCA genes 1 and 2, which can cause a lot of breast cancer. And we're just going to say, okay, it's a more ordinary case of breast cancer, but it's just in one breast. Talking about one person, if you've had it in one breast, how raised is the probability that you'll have it in the other, compared with the norm amongst people who've never had it at all? Well, it's hardly raised at all. Hardly at all. Now, the, the, a striking way of putting that is to say that the other breast is more like the breast of a stranger than it is of it to its own twin. Yeah. So the point here I'm making is that difference, difference creeps in even where you think you've defined everything. And this difference, this kind of hidden half, this enigmatic variation, we do, we, you could have, what good is it going to do you to define every lifetime exposure for that one woman? It's all going to be the same. To define the genetics, they're identical. To define the diet, it's identical. And yet you still have difference. Now, if you can't do it in one person where everything is identical, think how easy it's going to be, you know, how hard it's going to be really, between two individuals, two different individuals, where there are a number of factors that could be present are just kind of indescribably complicated and numerous. So, so it, that it gives really you a sense of the difficulty. And it really raises the question of how you should think about randomness, which I you know, alluded to a minute ago. I think about Hayek's uh, Nobel Prize uh, speech, The Pretense of Knowledge, which you reference, I think, in the book. Yeah. In that, in that, uh, in that speech, he, he talks about the idea that you know, if we had all the information, we could predict, say, the outcome of a sporting event. In other words, we have a lot of information in advance. A sporting event's very narrow. With the rules are very, you know, prescribed. Uh, you you can't say uh, I'm going to play this game in a different field than my opponent. There's a lot of things you can't innovate on or have be random. But there are inevitably things that you can't measure. What the quarterback had for breakfast in the case of a football game. Uh, what you know how the pitcher got along with his wife. Talked to his wife. Maybe. There's a conversation they had the morning of the game, and that somehow disrupted his normal practice, and he wasn't as effective that day. And so you can't forecast his performance. Other athletes, of course, are as reliable as clockwork or similarly, uh, some kind of clock. But, but what Hayek's saying in there is a little different than what you're saying. What Hayek is saying is that variation is so complex. There's so many causes to behavior. You'll never have data on everything you need to know. And what the causal economist says is that, of course, but I've got enough. I've got most of it. I've got the important things. I have data on the things that are, that are truly the levers of change. And what you're saying is, to, I say, I think it was two things. One, to remind you that those other levers are out there and maybe is large, much larger than they appear to be. And but the second is, I think the, the subtler point, and you know, we don't have to go into this in detail, but I think it's fascinating that there's something more than just you could say it's the true randomness. A lot of what we attribute to randomness, we, we just that's a way of saying I can't measure it, or I can't observe it, or I can't get my you know I can't get data on it. But 
there's also this weird micro, 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 micro quantum level uncertainty in the world. And you give the example of the woman who smokes like a like a chimney, uh, cigarettes like a chimney and lives to be 103 because the time that she would have gotten the cancer, uh, you know, she uh, her door front door was open and she got a, a little chill and she coughed. It expelled a tiny, tiny cell. Now, that's an example where that would have grown into cancer and killed her. But that's an example of where I just can't observe it. I can't observe it down to that micro, micro, micro level. But there's also the possibility there's something even finer going on, something more mysterious that that is beyond the 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 the, the calipers, beyond the survey questionnaire, et cetera. And that's a more philosophical question. I don't know if you have anything to say about it. You're free to respond. No, I I think um what you're describing with the possibility that, you know, we could discover the cough that saved somebody from cancer when you would expect them to get it is uh, it's akin to the idea of Laplace's demon. Laplace was a statistician who said that if we had complete knowledge of all the causal factors in the universe, then everything would become predictable. Of course. And the, the difference between that and the philosophical question about whether there is some kind of true randomness in the way that um, people sometimes talk about uh, quantum randomness um, uh, I, I think from a practical point of view, it doesn't actually matter. Yeah. If it's, if, it's, if it's not ascertainable, then it might as well be true randomness. I mean, there's a, there's a vigorous argument about whether true randomness exists. You know, Einstein famously didn't like the idea. Um, uh, I, I just don't mind because I don't think in the end it becomes that material, actually, to the problem, the practical problem of deciding what to do next. You know, well, if so. we don't know, we don't know. It's failed. It's failed from us in a certain fundamental sense, I think. Yeah. Uh, I, what, what's more, everyone would agree with that. The reason your book's interesting is besides the way you talk about it, and it's a fantastically entertaining read. But the reason it's interesting is the magnitude of it. Right? It's one thing to say, I can't quite predict the exact score of the football game, but I'm pretty good at figuring who's going to win. Or I can't get it within a certain number of points or touchdowns or whatever, but I can get close. You're suggesting a lot of times it's not close, and I think that's 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 really unpleasant to confront, and and but useful. And we'll get to the usefulness in a minute. Before we leave this though, this this section of the book, I want you to talk about Darwin's nose because <laughs> I just and there aren't many times you get to talk about Darwin's nose. So it, talk. Why is Darwin's nose in your book? This would be Charles Darwin, and nose meaning the thing in the front of your face. Yeah. So. Um... Charles Darwin says in his uh, autobiography, the voyage of the Beagle, the ship he sailed to the Galapagos Islands on, has been by far the most important event in my life and has determined my whole career. Yet it depended on so small a circumstance as my uncle offering, me to dry, offering to drive me 30 miles to Shrewsbury, which few uncles would have done, and on such a trifle as the shape of my nose. So how, how does the origin of species and Darwin's subsequent career depend on the shape of his nose? Well, I use this just as a really kind of a narrative illustration of the point you made about the cough, you know, that these trivial biographical events can be uh, incredibly deterministic. It's because the captain, Fitzroy of the Beagle, um, believed that the facial features revealed character. Uh, he was of his time. You know, this was a very common belief in those, yeah. those years. And um, Darwin's nose was really borderline. <laughs> <laughs> he, was, he was almost rejected for that voyage because of his nose. And Just I guess Fitz, Fitzroy <laughs> stared at his nose for a long time and, you know, judged the width of his nostrils and the bridge and thought, no, oh, I think this guy's going to be okay, you know, and eventually decided to admit him. Uh, <laughs> So you know, I mean, it's it's a slightly tongue-in-cheek example, but yeah, you know, I don't think I don't think that's kind of unfamiliar to most people's experience when we look back on our lives, the serendipity, the the chance moments. Um, I think there, uh, I think we all understand that these things can have disproportionately profound effects on the way things run for us. You know, I'm hugely conscious of the the element of luck in my life. You know, the chance, happenstance, again, whatever words you want to use for these kind of things. And um, I, I don't want to suggest that things like uh, a privileged upbringing or an impoverished upbringing or 
you know, great advantages in life of one kind or another are irrelevant. I, you know, I call it the hidden half. I don't call it the hidden whole. And then this is important. You know, I recognize regularity and I'm, ex and I'm as fascinated by it as anybody else. I'm, a, I'm an absolute probability nerd. You know, I, I, I'm completely captivated by the degree of regularity that we can find. It's simply that I think we neglect the irregularity. We don't appreciate sufficiently its power. You, you mentioned a, a moment ago the economists who say, okay, we don't have all the data, but we have enough. I just like to give a little illustration from a probabilistic point of view about how weak the data can be when it comes to trying to make it useful. And I'll take this one from medicine. So let's take the top 10 selling medicines in the United States. They work. You know, we have enough data. We can say with quite a lot of confidence that if you take one large group of people and you give them these drugs and you take another large group and you give them a placebo, then the people who take the drugs, they're more likely to do better with whatever condition they have. We know that. This the is gold solid standard. knowledge. It's been revealed gold in double-blind, random, randomized control trials. Absolutely. As, as, as robust as knowledge comes in this field. So, okay, we know these things work. How likely are they to work for you when you next take them? Amongst those top 10, these are the top 10, I, I repeat, you know, they have a lot of people's confidence. They've been through all the trials, the doctor who prescribes them, the physician who says, take this, they believe in them. Uh, well, it ranges from about one in four. So one in four of the people who take these things are actually going to show an improvement uh, against the measure that we say marks improvement, all the way to about one in 25, meaning 24 out of 25 times, these things that work don't work. Now, you know, I mean, this is, this, is, this is a little head spinning to say that things that genuinely work most of the time do not work. If your car didn't start 24 out of 25 times, you'd, you'd take it to the junkyard, you know. Um, but these are drugs which we can say work. Now, this is, I, I say this just to give a sense of the scale, the proportions that we're talking about when people say, we have enough data, we have enough regularity. So we can have a huge amount of regularity at the very big scale when we're looking at the differences between huge populations, which can be almost useless at a level of individual predictability. The same thing actually applies with a problem like cancer and smoking. If you take two countries, hypothetically, in one of them everybody smokes and in the other nobody smokes, you're going to see a big difference in the amount of lung cancer and other cancers in the smoking country. And you're going to be able to conclude from that, well, you know, it looks like smoking probably has a lot to do with this. On the other hand, if you focus just in the country where everybody smokes, and you say, okay, now how predictive is smoking of cancer? It's not predictive at all, because some people get it and some people don't. In other words, you're at a level of pure luck. Now, I say that, and I, you know, a lot of physicians will get really antsy. You know, they're going to say, ah, you can't call cancer luck. You know, there's a clear cause. And there is, until you try and understand it at the individual level. And then there is a large element of luck. These things are not one or the other. They are both. They are both luck and they are determined. And those things operate in tandem at different scales. We can observe them at different scales. We can observe one at the population level. We have to resort to the other at the individual level because there's no other way of explaining it. You have a whole population where everyone smokes the same number of cigarettes. Some people get cancer, some people don't. You have to acknowledge some element of luck. Now, you know, I get into trouble for saying this, but I can say that while at the same time firmly believing that smoking causes cancer. And people say, you can't have it both ways, but you can. You can have regular, clear knowledge at the probabilistic scale, like your economists, we think we know enough, and you can have complete confusion at the individual level. And it's that, that's, so, you know, that's your hidden half in those cases. It's how reliably can it tell you in the next instance when you next want to use this knowledge, will it work? You might find actually that your, your, your data is less useful than you thought it, maybe it would be. And of course, the flip side of that is the, um, the treatment that makes something better that probably would have gotten better on its own, but you don't know that. So you tend to attribute it to the phenomenon. Um, 
I had a I had a uh, a skin tag on my lower eyelid, and careful listener viewers will be able to notice that in past uh, YouTube uh, episodes of, of Econ Talk. Just a little white spot sitting on my lower eyelid. I went to the dermatology. Said, "Yeah, that's a little scary. It's on your lower eyelid. You should get a you get it removed." So I went to an eye doctor. He said, "Well, you know, I can remove it, but it's it's going to bleed a lot, and it's really not harmful. So it's up to you. It's mainly cosmetic." It's not going to hurt you. you do what you want. So I thought, I'm going to leave it alone. It's pretty much gone. It took two years. I, I, it fell, either fell off. You can look now if you want. It's in this side. It's pretty much gone. But if he had taken it off, I would have said, thank goodness I got rid of that. It could have, you know, overwhelmed me. And so many procedures, of course, are like that. The, you know, people attribute any post hoc ergo propter hoc after this, therefore, because of this a classic fallacy that's so hard for us as human beings to remember. The other thing I want to mention use as an example is the fact that you're on this program. And I and I want to uh, use that as a way to think about how I think luck is a little bit um, misleading about how, how to live. You know, there is uncertainty in life. There's a lot of randomness uh, from our own human perspective that we can't resolve in our lives or in interventions of various kinds, policy interventions and so on. But, you know, you're on this program Let's think about why you're on this program right now, why we're having this conversation. You're on this program. I never heard of your book, which surprised me because it's right up my alley, as listeners will know. But I hadn't heard of it. And um, I think, I didn't check beforehand, but I think Brent Orell, who's at AEI and who's a friend and an Econ Talk listener, interviewed you about the book a while ago and recommended it to me. And I wrote you, I think, and asked for a copy of it. And I promptly forgot about it for a long time. <laughs> And quote, as fate would have it, just luck on your ha on your behalf, unless this goes badly, Michael, which it could <laughs> in the remaining half an hour or so. It, it could end up to be a, a major uh, disappointment or worse. But assuming it goes okay, this good, bit of good fortune occurred because I was looking through some PDFs and I, I saw the title and it kind of grabbed me again and I opened it again and I started reading it again and I really liked it and I thought, ah, maybe I'll do that. And then I forgot about it again. And you could have, at, at this point, uh, prospective guests uh, sometimes intervene. They write me an email and say, hope you're still thinking about my book, in which case I usually go, oh, yeah, I should look at that. And who knows what kind of mood I'm in that day or whether I've had eight guests about the hidden half on recently, in which case you're doomed. You got no chance. Yeah. But in this case, it kind of grabbed me and I and I decided to to invite you. But so what's the lesson? <laughs> and you could be, you could, the answer is there isn't one, right? Because most of what occurred kind of, and I'm going to try to, I'm going to push back against this and get your reaction because a lot of people believe the way you get on a program like this, you know, where there's just too many books and not enough episodes, you got to be persistent. And mm. what you should have done, Michael, you almost missed out. You just got lucky. What you should have done, you should have taken life by the reins you should have grabbed your opportunity. You should have emailed me yourself two or three times and said, you know, I, Brett, you know, Brett really liked our conversation. You should listen to it. I think we'd make a, and people do that to me all the time. And sometimes it works. And sometimes I go, oh, I wish this person would leave me alone. <laughs> you know what? I, I've got, I've got, I have one potential guest. I got four or five emails in one day from alleged strangers who said, you know, I'm reading this book. I think you'd really like it. I got four or five. I thought, oh, this is a concerted effort by this person mm -hmm. to get on the program, which sometimes I respect. Depends how well the email's crafted and what the, the message in it is. But I think I think often we think there's a strategy, which is either be really persistent, never give up, or ah, don't bug them too much. Because And the answer is you never know enough about the person you're interacting with to know how they're going to respond to that kind of stimulus. And you don't know what they had for breakfast and what kind of conversation they had with their wife and what were the six books they read before. So it, it, it is, quote, complicated, which is part of the randomness. But the other thing I want us to argue is that, you know, if you do it enough, if you interact with enough people in a thoughtful, kind and helpful way, good things happen to you. All right. Mm. I can't tell you how many times I've said yes to a request that I wasn't sure was going to work out really well for me. Someone asked a favor of me and I said yes. And I got some lovely thing as a result. Hmm. And I think when you answer a lot of favors, if you're not careful, you don't get any work done. So again, not an iron <laughs> rule. <laughs> but at the same time, you do enhance your luck as Branch 
you know, uh, yeah. as Branch Rickey said, I think, what is it? 99% of luck is persistent. I can't, I can't remember the quote right now. But. I, I think you're, you're spot on there, Ross. Um, I mean, it's, it's interesting, you know, what, which attributes are going to bring you success? You know, the idea that we can observe certain people and we can define these things. One that I really like is, uh, is risk taking. So if you if you talk to business leaders, entrepreneurs particularly, they'll say, "Yeah, you know, the key thing you've got to be able to take a big risk." Yeah. The thing you never hear from is all the people who took big risks and are not business leaders and successful they went out of entrepreneurs. Business, yeah. They went out of business, you know. <laughs> so, so should you take big risks? No. Well, you shouldn't just listen to the people for whom it worked out, you know, because that's. Not, so there's a kind of huge um, selection bias, uh, survivor bias going on in those kind of reports of what works. As you say, it's probably harder to predict which of these strategies is going to work on given individuals, you know. Um, you can become a pain in the neck if you're persistent, or you can, you know, you can swing it. You know, it's uh, it's um, it's pretty hard to tell. The the the, the point you make, I think, about um, sometimes just kind of chucking yourself at a lot of opportunities is is also pays off. I I, I think there's I think there's something that in that again because. Um, in a way, the way I like to think about it is that you're making yourself open to coincidence. Yeah. So thinking of coincidence as a benign kind of risk, you know, that here's or just as a beneficent chance, you know, you just you just kind of I mean, a lot of this isn't going to work out, or it's just going to be a nothing. You know, it's neither one way or the other, but some of it will. You know, that's the nature of chance. That um, once in a while things roll for you, you know, and I think there is a reasonable human strategy where you say, "Okay, I'm just going to try and give luck a lot of opportunities in my life." Especially, that it will be luck. Especially when you can avoid or choose not to implement the left hand tail. Uh, I I think this has something to do with convexity or concavity, and and now some Talib would tell me which one it is. I think it's convexity, but. Um, the the idea that having lots of options that you don't have to take you don't it's a bad idea to throw yourself into the the uh, randomness wheel onto the randomness wheel where everything that happens to you could happen but if you can reject the worst things that can happen and avoid them because you don't have to say yes to the request mm. that follows after the request that you did uh, I do think uh, good things can happen I think it's not not a bad uh, a piece of advice. So I, I like that. Uh, let's talk about something that I've heard recently and you talk about, which I find very provocative, the weakest link principle uh, for, for solving, for, for as an impediment to solving problems. Uh, yeah, I came across it um, in some work by a philosopher of science called Nancy Cartwright. And um, she tells a story, very interested in causation, uh, she tells a story about a project in a province in India, Tamil Nadu, uh, which was backed by the, the um, World Bank. And what they observed in Tamil Nadu that was, was that there was a very high rate of infant mortality. You know, kids were being born uh, uh, underdeveloped. So the odds were against them from the beginning. And quite a lot of them were dying, you know, too many. And they discovered that there was a phenomenon there whereby pregnant mothers were what they called eating down. They didn't have much faith in the health system there. They didn't want to push out a big baby. So they reduced the amount of food that they were taking as they became more pregnant. And it was this that was contributing to the malnourishment of their babies and reducing the chances that their own children would survive. And you could understand why they felt this way, but clearly the consequences were pretty catastrophic. So an aid team went in there and they tried to understand. They, they didn't just march in with a solution. They tried to understand the thinking, the fears. Uh, they tried to find um, ways of uh, intervening that would be accepted and would be felt to be constructive. It was a sensitive program. And they did a couple of things in principle. They talked to the mothers and said, this is why we think this is happening. This is the link between the death of your children and 
By the way, actually, healthcare has improved a lot around here. Did you know there's a new clinic open and, you know, and there are technically better and, you know, it's less risky than maybe it was in your mother's day? Um, and, um, and also, if you don't have enough food, we're going to help you out there as well. Uh, they, they did this and the results were fantastic. You know, it was a really very, very effective program recognized by the World Bank as having a high standard of high quality evidence for an effective intervention. One of those rare things that really worked. So this is where it gets interesting because Nancy tells the story about what happens next. And everybody was very excited with this intervention and they decided, okay, there must be other parts of the world where we can use this. So they went to Bangladesh where the problems were very similar, some communities. And they did the same thing. And it failed. There was no meaningful improvement in infant mortality. So at this point, they all sit down and scratch their heads and say, how come something that works so well for so many people, and again, we've done proper trials of this thing, we have good evidence, doesn't work here at all? Well, the difference, as the story goes, is that whereas in Tamil Nadu, the original site of the experiment, family uh, meals were controlled by the mother. In Bangladesh, they were controlled by the mother-in-law. The domestic head of the household was not the mother, it was the mother-in-law, the son's mother. Now, maybe when she was handing out the food, she was less sensitive to the needs of the mother than she was to her own son, possibly. I'm speculating now. Yeah. Um, maybe the researchers had only talked to the mother about the improvements in healthcare. They hadn't talked to the mother-in-law. Maybe they hadn't made clear to the mother-in-law the link between um, eating down and malnourished children and infant mortality. Maybe they'd said that to the mother, but not to the mother-in-law, so the mother-in-law wasn't quite persuaded that this was a legitimate argument. But one way or another, the, the mother-in-law turned out to be a central causative agent you know and uh, could you have predicted that no. you know and this is what nancy means by the weakest link you can have absolutely robust evidence and you can take it coming right back to the principle that we articulated right at the beginning that knowledge is a is a case of does our information understanding travel you can take robust knowledge and understanding does it travel from one place to another it might fail because of this one weak link. Everything else you got right, but you just failed to appreciate the role of the mother-in-law. Um, I'll give you another example. There's, um, there was a, a project, again, I think it was in the Indian subcontinent to kind of um, uh, connect a community to a public water supply, rather than having to go to standpipes and things like this. And they went to a huge efforts to make sure the supply was reliable and the water was good and that everybody knew about it and all the rest. So tell me the one thing they forgot to do, which meant the project had an appallingly low sign up rate. They forgot about the importance of the photocopier. And, you know, at this point you say, well, what has a photocopy got to do with the water supply? Well, in order to sign up, you need a duplicated copy of the application form or whatever it was. You know, nobody could duplicate the form. You needed to go into an office with a photocopier. And this proved such a hurdle. <laughs> I mean, it's preposterous. The final implementation stage, the stage of design. This is an example from Esther Duflo, who was Nobel Prize winner uh, recently in economics. Um, uh, uh, where her point was that these very small details, almost the last link in the chain for her, these very small details of implementation can abs be absolutely critical to the success or failure of an idea of a project. Um, so th there you can see this, this weak link principle. Uh, everything else can be fine, but if you're missing one piece, it can be a 100% failure. Yeah, the challenge there, of course, is that there's a, a tendency to then say, well, just we got to make sure we have a photocopier. And then when you get to this <laughs> other village, it's yeah. the mother-in-law or it's yeah. the soil. Or, Something else. You know, we, we've talked yeah. about the pro this issue before of deworming, which was this exciting finding that uh, removing parasites from school children improved their ability to learn and that and therefore improved their ability to or to get a job and therefore that improved their ability to avoid poverty and therefore – Deworming is the most effective 
uh, aid vehicle we can possibly have. It's 10 cents a pill a day. It's fabulous. And a lot of those results didn't hold up. They didn't generalize and they didn't scale. Um, and you start to think about why. And one of them is the weakest link. I mean, the obvious point, if you read uh, William Easterly's work, who's been on the program, you know, obviously education is the key to ending poverty in, poor, in the poorest countries. You need a better education system. Well, if you have great education, but you can't get out of your village to find a job or the job market doesn't work very well, there's always often these weakest links that that make it hard for the intervention to be as successful as it was in the first time you observed it. And the the, the only thing I'm adding to yours, which I think is important, is that the weakest link is at the same weakest link every time, which yeah. makes it hard. Yeah. <laughs> Deeply, deeply frustrating. You know, Esther Duflo, uh, who I mentioned a moment ago, I mean, she would, on the question of education, the first thing she'd say is that we have all these magic bullets, you know, in aid economics over the years, which have one after the other seemed not to have the success that we expected. Yeah. Um, you know, and why is that? And and she says, um, her argument uh, is that... Um, you know, quite often it doesn't depend on the, the kind of what they call pressing the button on the machine, you know, yeah. just getting some whole grand theory started. Because if, you, if that's all it takes, oh, well, let's just implement, you know, let's just run the machine, you know, and it'll all be okay. She says, no, the, the machine doesn't work if you don't have the right language for the school textbooks. If you don't get your fingernails dirty with the real grit of the implementation you know, the local contextual details are every bit as important as the grand theorizing and the big answers, you know, and without both of those, you know, you're not going to get anywhere. And I, you know, I think she probably has a point. Her emphasis is very much on the low level detail. Other people emphasize the higher level theory. You know, if you cut the education budget by 30%, you're not going to do too many people much good. Right? Um, but if you similarly, you know, if you get the, if you get the, 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 tone of the textbooks wrong you know you can increase the budget but buy the wrong textbooks and you know you don't do any good either so you know it's it seems pretty clear to me that you you need to think at every level and that there's this endless iterative problem of going back to the theory testing through experiment considering the details trying to get an understanding from local people, what the local motivations are, and then doing the whole thing all over again and repeating it and repeating it, understanding that causes work in teams. The, you know, to take your, your, your player analogy earlier on, um, it's very seldom one thing. Uh, it's usually an interaction of many things, you know, and um, uh, any one of them could go wrong and the whole thing falls down. So... Understanding causality is, I agree, maddening, infuriating, you know, endlessly frustrating. Can I tell you one story about toilets? Yeah, tell us that. I know that story. Continue your okay, book. It's a great story. I, 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 I do like this one because open defecation around the world is an enormous problem. Uh, you know, if you don't have the facilities, it can cause all kinds of health difficulty uh, it's pretty obvious to see why water courses become polluted, disease is easily carried. To solve that problem in India, and they really want to solve it, would require building a new toilet or a new latrine about once every couple of seconds or something for, I don't know, 30 years. It's a monstrous problem. So you say, okay, well, the state is going to be pretty constrained in its ability to do this. Let's see if we can find some way of motivating individuals to do it. Now, here's the causal problem. How do you do that? So team went in and they said, OK, let's first try to understand it. Maybe if we just give people some money, a grant for a toilet, you know, and they come back and they show us they built one, then fine, uh, that's the way to do it. So we don't have to build it. We just give out a bit of, you know, money, maybe a loan. Maybe they have to repay it. Well, they did that and they found that people spend it on something else. So that doesn't work. So you say, okay, um, well, maybe they're doing it. Um, uh, maybe we have to teach them about the importance of building a latrine, you know, and then maybe they'll do it. Or, or maybe we don't give them the money until they've built the latrine, you know, and that will work. And so you don't give them the money, but you tell them they can have the money when they've done it and they don't do it. Uh, so that doesn't work, you know. So you go through all these kind of things and you have to say, well, when they say, as many of them did, we can't afford it, what do they mean? 
do they mean they're not convinced that it's the most productive expenditure they could undertake? Is that what they mean? They do have the cash, but they don't want to spend it on this. Do they mean they actually just don't have the cash? Do they mean they think it's just not worth it on any terms? You know, what is what exactly going on? It so you have to do quite a lot to understand what that means. You know, before you can get it. Now, eventually, they 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 um uh, they started doing an education program. To say, here's why toilets really matter, and here's some money up front. So you know, you uh, do those things at the same time, and they built the toilets. Did that reduce the problems caused by? <laughs> infection and transmission of disease and so on, um, caused by um, uh, bad water, uh, polluted water? No. And there is huge evidence to suggest that good sanitation is one of the most constructive things you can do to improve human welfare. But in this instance, did it work where they tried all these pilot schemes? Actually, no. So they have to go back again and say, well, why didn't it work? Maybe you need a threshold of 80%, 90% of people having these toilets. Maybe even though they have the toilets, the custom is so ingrained that they don't actually use them. Maybe it's one person defecating near a water source is enough. You know, um, Maybe it's animal waste, which is now the problem because they're cheek by jowl with the animals and maybe they're going to, you know, so, um, what do we do about that? Do we need to another program to kind of isolate one from the other? You know, And so it goes on and on and on. On. You know, now the the interesting uh, thing about that is the imagination that you need, the curiosity that you need, just to keep on asking questions about the myriad potential influences that could play into the success or failure of this project. Uh, it's almost impossible to anticipate which way the thing is going to go, given a particular set of parameters. You just have to keep trying it. And again, this iterative process, theory, thinking, imagining, asking, testing, details over and over again. Yeah, they, you know, I'm, a, I'm not a big fan of intervention generally, but I am a big fan of helping people. And I think those two things kind of collide here for me. And, and I think it, they're, in some ways, it's the story of the development literature of the last 25 to 50 years, which is people with good intentions intervene with imperfect knowledge and they hope to do something for someone or worse, do something to someone. You know, the, the most classic example of this, I would say, is giving people uh, bed nets for malaria to, re to reduce malaria in hope of, of keeping mosquito bites down. And the people get the nets and they use them for fishing. Hmm. Now, when you hear that story, you think, oh, yeah, well, that's, you know, that's just an excuse for not sending the nets, not helping them. Because we've got to educate them and we've got to maybe give them enough money so that they can afford to use them as bed nets instead of fishing nets. Or give them fishing nets with the bed nets that work better. And it's always one level down to that next weakest link in theory. And I, I have to say, you know, as as – eager as I am to see philanthropy succeed, the whole idea of it is somewhat intellectually offensive, ethically offensive to me when I, when I think about it, which is that we know what's best for you. You need to be using a toilet. Here's how we do it. Come on, get with the program. You'll be mm -hmm. better off. And often they've, you know, they've evolved all kinds of norms to deal with the fact that they don't have a toilet or whatever is the issue. Mm -hmm. And we're not just oblivious to those, because we're imperfectly informed, we don't respect them. We say, yeah. oh, that's the wrong way to fix it. Don't do that. You know, do, this is our way and our way's better. And I, I think there's an incredible hubris. Um, you know, listeners can go back and hear my episodes with Nina Monk and Jeffrey Sachs, which are mm -hmm. two un, unforgettable, un, uh, sometimes unpleasant uh, episodes in the history of Econ Talk. And, you know, I think it was in the Sachs episode where, or maybe I heard it somewhere else, I can't remember, but, you know, they, they, the outsiders, the economists, the wise people, they decided everybody needs to grow corn or whatever it was, maize, because, because it works really well in your soil and you're stupidly growing yams hmm. or, or vice versa without understanding a thing <laughs> about these people who lived this way for, for centuries and, and sometimes, of course, outsiders have insights that they bring technology or useful things. But a lot of times those people on the on the inside are just going like, 
like these guys are really pitiful. They don't know anything about farming. Like what would the world look like if everybody in, the, in this piece of the subcontinent of Africa were growing maize? Maybe that'd be a disaster. You know, it, it, the irony, sorry, I'll get off my soapbox in a second. The irony is that, you know, you'd say to the people who are defecating in the fields, well, you don't realize you're imposing costs on others. So your natural personal incentive is to is to avoid a toilet, but you don't realize that if everybody used the toilet, we'd all be better off. There's mm-hmm. there's this tragedy of the commons. There's this extern- externality problem. And then the reverse of that is that the, the researcher then does the same thing. They say, everybody needs to grow maize. And then everybody grows a maize. <laughs> it's a glut on the market and the price plummets and they're starving because they don't understand the full richness of what goes on. So it's it's a world's a complicated place. I, I, I mean, I, 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 I don't agree with you entirely about um, opposing intervention, but I do agree with you entirely about the risks. I think they're huge. And I think we've plenty of examples where um, people have gone in overconfident about their ability to understand and analyze a problem, and they've imposed solutions which have been counterproductive. I think the, the, the literature is full of those kind of examples. And I think there's a very reasonable ethical debate about what's uh, the most constructive way for societies to advance. Um, you know, I'm familiar with Angus Dayton, uh, British economist based in the United States. You know, I was, it takes Previous a pretty good view yes. of aid. Yeah. And um, uh, I, I think that's, uh, you know, that's a, that's a strong argument. I don't go the whole way with it. Neither do I. I'm, I'm just saying that, that the whole mindset which should be how do I help this pe- person help themselves? Yeah, it has to be at the center, or it does not. Often does not work because you don't know the weakest link, and you don't understand even the stronger links. <laughs> yeah, and no, I, I, the, I think the the point I would make is that you know Daniel Kahneman asked about the worst of all human cognitive biases says overconfidence, and that's that's the kind of characteristic that I think uh, you know the hidden half is aimed at. It's that belief that we know. Uh, we know because we're smart types of people and we have a lot of data and we have sophisticated AI or machine learning and we have all these other wonderful techniques for you know, discovering causation. Um, but people have always felt like that and they've always made spectacular mistakes. And you know, you just you don't have to look far to see examples where presumptions about having uh, really robust knowledge of come back and kicked us pretty quickly. You know, I mean, just prior Donald Trump. Tell you know the the the. You read any analysis of the political conditions in the United States prior to Donald Trump, and people thought they had pretty well understood. And then he arrives. Uh, the same in the Europe. You know, with the Brexit vote in the United Kingdom, that was considered by most people to be highly unlikely, and then out of nowhere, apparently, to the point where quite a lot of people. You know, there were a few who said, we need to start tearing up the political textbooks. We don't understand how things are anymore. Well, we, had a leader. Of we had the financial crisis. Yeah, exactly. The, you know, um, w- uh, what were all those uh, phrases about the Goldilocks economy? Uh, you know, we, 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 the great moderation. Uh, we had it nailed down, didn't we, until we didn't? Yeah. Uh, you know, these, 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 time and again, you see this kind of hubris, I think, in um, uh, people whose expertise, deep understanding. I don't deny the depth of their understanding, um, but it gives them a kind of false assurance, I think, uh, that, that because, because they know a lot, they therefore know enough. And I think that's very seldom the case. So you have some really eloquent passages in the book, which I would read, but they're longish. Um, but I love them, and I encourage readers to, to read them, where you basically say, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm not anti-science. I don't think we should give up on understanding everything. We should just be aware that our understanding is imperfect. And mm. I am like you. I ha- I make the same speech all the time. People say, oh, you're anti-science because you, you're skeptical. I said, well, no, that's called science. <laughs> and I'm anti-bad science is what I am. And I'm pro-good science. Why do you think this, why are we so lonely? Why are you <laughs> and I so uncommon uh, it, or seemingly uncommon in our willingness to embrace uh, a, a more, what I would call a more accurate level of competence about what we know. Well, I have some optimism about that. I mean, I'm taking part in the 
conference um, uh, which is called The Known Unknowns, which is about um, current state of knowledge about COVID. Uh, we have something like 2,000 people coming along who were attracted by that title. And um, so I think possibly there's been a bit of a learning moment around uh, the pandemic, actually, a sense that um, the uncertainties attached are huge on every side, Yeah, uh, that we're on the one hand, we have the bench science. The discovery of the vaccine has been mind blowing, incredible. Uh, right? uh, I mean, you know, so the, inspiring. The, the sophistication, the genius involved, the accumulation of learning is just as absolutely astonishing. On the other hand, some of the more social, economic, epidemiological understanding has been struggling, and I, I don't um, blame it. You know, I, this is, I don't think this is a fault. I think if there's a fault, it's been the claims of overconfidence about how yeah. things will pan out. You know, I've been wrong about the pandemic. I thought the serological studies would show that there was a huge amount of unrecognized transmission. Uh, you know, that there was a vast amount of asymptomatic infection in, had, had already taken a place. And now they didn't show that. Now, there's some argument about whether they're sensitive enough to pick it all up, but, you know, um, they didn't show what I expected them to show. I was wrong. And I think, you know, um, we should all sort of try to be able to say those kind of things because if we do not have that kind of self-critical uh, aspiration to humility, I'm sure we have plenty of your audience, Russ, who don't find my comments humble. <laughs> <laughs> I'm resigned to that. But I think there is an attitude of epistemic humility about which I'm quite confident, if yeah. I can offer you that paradox. Yeah, I like that. I think, it's, I think it's absolutely necessary. Otherwise, you know, you're just riding for a fall. You know, the number of occasions when people have bet the ranch on one thing or another and lost the ranch. Now, we see, as we as we mentioned earlier, you know, it's only the people who kept the ranch that are still around to talk about it. And the ones who failed have retreated. They're off stage now. We don't hear from them too much. Um, but, you know, betting the ranch on our knowledge is a dangerous thing. And by and large, science does not succeed by becoming complacent about its knowledge. But if you watch the practice, you know, too much of it is, it seems to me, to it feels like sales. It doesn't feel like a skeptical, humble inquiry. It feels more like people trying to tell you a story or win your vote, uh, convince, persuade. You know, um, these are the skills of rhetoric and marketing. They're not the foundations of science. And, you know, what goes for science, I think, goes for most human endeavors. It should apply to government. Uh, politics is a difficult one. Um, <laughs> it should apply in economics. It should apply to business. Uh, you know, with, without these, this kind of basic humility in our approach, we're suckers for a story. And some stories are true, some stories aren't. Uh, but you'll never know if you're one of those confirmation bias machines which just looks for proof that your story is the right one. You have to have that open mind, that skepticism, that humility to discover that you were wrong. And then the willingness to say it and start all over again. Otherwise, don't come looking for me to me for investment. So the other part of your book, which I loved, uh, is how you end it. And I, we can end our conversation on this topic, which is, uh, and I, I'm thinking about this a lot because it's uh, the book I'm writing, which is, you know, uncertainty is just the way it is. <laughs> there is this dream that will resolve all of it with just, an, if we just get enough data, big data, artificial intelligence improves, then I'll figure out who to marry because the algorithm will be able to predict it. I'll get all the information and like Laplace's demon, I'll, I'll be able to be sure I'm happy. I don't have to have all this uncertainty and 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 risk and, and it's going to be fine and, and I'll reduce the probabilities. We'll have customized medicine, which you talk about in the book. So yeah, right now the top 10 drugs don't work that well on every single person who takes them, but just a matter of time and and it's not a bad attitude to have, right? In theory, it's it's what makes the world better, this confidence, this overconfidence that we can better understand the world. Because without it, maybe we just give up and we wouldn't know half the things we know today that have been glorious and saved lives and morally meaningful lives and longer lives and so on. But 
you make the case for this, what I call irreducible uncertainty, this uh, hidden half, it's not so bad. It's okay. You can, you can survive it. it. In fact, you could embrace it. So talk about, make the case for why it's okay to be in the dark about certain things. I mean, I, I couldn't agree with more. Um, there are clearly benefits to uh, irrational exuberance, as I recall uh, your central banker describing yeah. it. Um, you know, it motivates Don't call people. him mine, Michael, but I know oh, you, okay. meant, you meant as an American. Okay. <laughs> All right. Done. Um, the, there are, motivation is important. And, you know, um, people need motivating by the promise of better. You know, and if they create for themselves such an expectation, you know, well, if it gets them out of bed in the morning, maybe that's not such a bad thing. But there, and, and there are cases where you really want to know. You know, if I go into hospital and I'm offered an operation, ideally, I would like to know whether it worked. I'm just not going to compromise on the certainty there. I really would like certainty in that instance. So, you know, I'm not going to say that certainty is, uh, we should just reject it. On the other hand, how about I tell you exactly the time and manner of your death? Do you want to know that? Maybe? Maybe you're not so sure. <laughs> I mean, there's an old joke that, you know, if you tell me where I'm going to die, I'll just make sure I'm not there at the moment, you know. So, um, but, you know, maybe, maybe that kind of certainty, or do we really want that kind of certainty? How about I tell you how all the films end? You know, it could be arranged. I can do that for you, Russ. You know, I can you know, tell me what you want to view this evening. I'll look it up, you know, and I'll tell you how it finishes. There's no uncertainty then. You know, we can get rid of that. Um, are you really sure you want to know who you're going to marry when you're five years old or something like that and all the interest? And you say, oh, well, I'm just passing time now until we get to the big one because I know that's the one it's going to be, you know. Uh, do you want to strip out every piece of excitement from life, because quite a lot of excitement is because we simply don't know. Do you want to say to every business in the world, look, if you just do the probabilities, your investment route will be safe and secure? That's not going to work. The way that businesses, are, some successful businesses are some more successful than others is because they take chances, you know, and they think they've seen an opportunities which others haven't. And they're uncertain about the outcomes of these things. That's what makes business, you know, exciting and possible. That we have this huge experiment going on there about competing visions and understandings of what the world is really like and what's going to sell and what isn't. If you reduce it all to some kind of probabilistic calculus, everybody will take the same calculus. And like everybody growing maize, yeah. it won't work for anybody. <laughs> you know, so you have to, you ha this is life. You can't reject uncertainty without rejecting life. I just do not want to know everything. I want some of it to be an adventure. You know, I want some of it to be mysterious. I want to, the possibility of discovery. I want the dance to unfold, you know, in its own way. I don't want to be told at the age of 59 years and three months, you know, you will be in position X over here. Um, does anybody? I, I, I find it slightly, you know, now certain, as I come back, you know, you'll sort of roll back now a bit, certain degrees of confidence about the future, yes, they're good. I, I, I would like to know that I'm not going to be impoverished or I'm not going to be murdered, you know. I mean, those would be helpful. <laughs> um, but I, um, beyond that, no, I want a lot of room for uncertainty. I really do. Uh, it, it feels to me what life is about. My guest today has been Michael Blasland. His book is The Hidden Half. Michael, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Thanks for inviting me, Ross. It's been a pleasure talking to you. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.